Okay. Let's turn to Second Chronicles. Two more studies in Chronicles. And then what do we do? Amen. Amen. And then we keep going right. Well, it's that way for you. Hezekiah. Let's see what Hezekiah has. Okay, we'll pick up at Second Chronicles thirty one. Let's pray. Father, again, we truly thank you and treasure this time. Thank you for your word. Go before us, Lord, we pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we've been talking about Hezekiah. Last time we were together, we saw the last couple of chapters, what a great man he was, how he was a man who removed the, uh, the rubbish from the, the temple. He put the sacrificial system back into place, uh, gathering all the people together to uh, assemble to worship the Lord in Jerusalem. Um, uh, he put the olive branch out, remember, for Israel to come on down and be a part. Some people laugh. Some people won't laugh. They'll join you, you know. So we're seeing all these great things. Now in chapter 31, we see Hezekiah as a great reformer. He's bringing Israel back to its uh, former worship and the things of God. And, and, and I just love that about Hezekiah. And um, so the people now, they're starting to go back. Remember, they they uh, they were having such a great time at the Passover that um, they said, hey, can we do this another seven days, right? It, was, it must have been some, some celebration of the Lord, right? So the 15th day now worship is over. Now everybody starts to have to go back home. And, um, but before they go home, they, they clean up one more thing. And um, it's at verse 1. Um, in the 31st chapter of Second Chronicles, it says there, Now when all this was finished, all Israel who were present went out to the cities of Judah and broke the sacred pillars and pieces. And they cut down the wooden images and threw down the high places and the altars from all Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh until they had utterly destroyed them all. And then all the children of Israel returned to their own cities, every man to his possession. So we, again, we, when, when, you, when you're reading 1 uh, uh, Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, over and over and over again, we see this pattern. The people are really stoked for God. They're, you know, they leave, they're excited, they chop down the altars, they get rid of all the idols, which is a beautiful thing. But then what happens? God blesses them, you know, and, and what happens? The cycle starts all over again. They forget their God. They start to uh, dabble in the world, then they incorporate the world into their, into their lives. And before you know it, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're living like heathens. And then God sends what? He sends a disaster. He sends people to annihilate them, what have you. And then, oh, we need you, Lord. You know, it's this constant, you know, up and down uh, lifestyle for the, for the nation of Israel. Here they are, though. They're, they're getting rid of the idols, which is a great thing to do. And um, now we see Hezekiah now setting up the priesthood. He's restoring, again, the priesthood. Remember, the priesthood was out of vogue, right? It wasn't, it wasn't in anymore, right? Everybody was just doing whatever they wanted to do. And now Hezekiah says, you know what? I'm going to reestablish the priesthood. In verse 2, he appointed the divisions of the priests and the Levites according to their divisions. Now, this was the rotation of the 24 divisions. Remember when Zechariah, when he, when he went into burn incense in the New Testament, remember he was, he was part of the divisions. He was one of the, he was, he was in a division there. So they would worship, they would uh, do their, you know, their time, so to speak, in Jerusalem, and then they would return back to their cities, right? And then an another set of, you know, priests and Levites would take over and they would be in their division. 
Hezekiah sets all that back up. He, he puts it all back into place. And that's why it says each man according to his service, the priests and the Levites, they, you know, the burnt offerings, the peace offerings to serve and to give thanks and praise to the gates of the camp. You know, everybody had their job to do, right, so to speak. And um, the king also appointed a portion of his possessions for the burnt offerings. So here we see Hezekiah doesn't hold anything back. He's actually using the, the things from the palace as offerings. Um, he, he's, he's sharing his, his wealth uh, with, with the, uh, the priests and the, and the Levites there. For what? The morning offerings, the burnt offerings, um, and all the, all the different celebrations, the Sabbaths, the new moons, and the set feasts. Notice, as it, as it is written in the law of the Lord, again, Hezekiah bringing Israel back to the law, back to the word. Uh, all great revivals, if you've ever seen any revival, um, the greatest revivals, where, wherever it may be, it was always getting back to the word. Every time, it's always getting back to the word. So we see here King Hezekiah he doesn't overlook anything when it comes to getting Israel back to its spiritual life. And in verse 4, it says, Moreover, he commanded the people who dwelt in Jerusalem to contribute support. Right? He's, he's, now he's getting everybody into the game, so to speak. Right? Everybody's going to have flesh in the game. So he calls all the people in Jerusalem to contribute, to support uh, the priests and the Levites. Now, why? Why would, why would he encourage them to support the priests and the Levites, that they might, notice, devote themselves to the law of the Lord. He's asking everyone to give to the work, especially to the priests and the Levites, obviously. For what? So that they can focus on teaching the Bible. Getting back to the Word. Right? And back in Numbers, in, in the 18th chapter of Numbers, Moses told the people, um, uh, you know, behold, I, uh, I have given the children of Levi all, the, all, Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform. What was that work? The work of the tabernacle of meeting. And hereafter, the children of Israel shall not come near the tabernacle of meeting lest they bear sin and die. Right. It was it was a consecrated job, the Levites and the priests. And then he says, but the Levites shall perform the work of tabernacle of meeting and they shall bear their own iniquity. It shall be a statute forever. Here, Hezekiah is going back hundreds and hundreds of years to to reestablish the giving, the tithes to the Levites, to the priests, to do the work of ministry, just as Moses told the children hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Why? And, and, um, and it's in uh, Numbers 18, 24. For the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer up as a heave offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites as an inheritance. Therefore, I have said to them among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. So the tithe was given to the Levites, to the priests, because they had no inheritance. If you remember, they weren't given a land, right? All the other tribes of Israel were given possessions, land to, 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 to live and to enjoy life and enjoy the family and serve God. And, you know, he gave them a bunch. But the Levites and the priests, they didn't have a land. They, they didn't have that. They were to serve the Lord. So how are they going to make money if they don't have land? All the tribes were to give 10% of their money so that the Levites and the priests didn't have to work. They could dedicate themselves to the work of ministry. The priests were to depend on the people for their provision. And why is that? So they could be freed from the everyday duties and focus on the Lord and his house and the Lord's ministry. So when you hear that, you say, well, is that is that in the New Testament? It is. It is the Apostle Paul, excuse me. The Apostle Paul, he would agree because in first Corinthians nine eleven he says, if we have sown spiritual things for you, 
Is it a great thing if we reap material things? The Apostle Paul was sowing the Spirit, the Word, into the lives of the Corinthians. And he's saying, if, I, if we're doing that, are we not allowed to get material things from you? And then he said, even so the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. But what's interesting with that is that that is not a hard and fast rule. Because right after that, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9.15, but I have used none of these things. Nor have I written these things that it should be done so to me, for it would be better for me to die than anyone should make my boasting void. He said, rather than me taking money from you, because the Corinthians were complaining that, you know, you know, this is all a sham. Paul, Paul is, he's weak, he's out for the money, and he's saying, you know what, I'd rather not take anything from you. He goes, and then he says, for, I, I, for if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if, if against my will I have been entrusted with a stewardship, he says, all right, uh, excuse me, back at 16, for if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul was more concerned with preaching the gospel than using the gospel just to get money. He wasn't about that. He was about preaching the gospel. And he, he said, you know what? I'd rather not receive anything for, from you. And then he says down at verse 18, what is my reward then? That when I preach the gospel, I present the gospel of Christ without charge. He goes, I'm just going to preach without charge. I'm not going to, I'm not going to take any of your money. Paul the apostle worked with his own hands. He was a tent maker. And he said, I'd rather do that than to receive money from you people. Right? So today... I believe every pastor is going to have to give an account to God. Every pastor is going to have to give an account to God. Now, me personally, I worked 15 years as a bivocational pastor. I worked a full-time job, and I was also a pastor for 15 years. And it wasn't until I was able to receive my pension that the Lord put it on my heart that now it's, it, you can go full-time. Now, I was getting flack from pastors. They were like, oh, you're not trusting the Lord. You, you know, you, how come you're not just, you know, you just, you know, why don't you just, you know, let, let, let the church cover your bills and this and that. I said, because it's not on my heart. I have to give an account to God. And, and it was during that time where we were able to accumulate a, a lot of money. And then we went, when we moved to Irvington from, from Yonkers to Irvington, and we, we built that place out. That was a that was hundred grand. To build that place out. But it was a step of faith. We got out of the Seventh-day Adventist church and we went to Irvington. Right? And then this was another step of faith coming here. To come to Yorktown. And then the Lord said, okay, retire, get a pension. It offsets a lot of the money for the church. But I think it, 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 there's no hard, set, fast rule as to how... A minister, a pastor is to, to receive money. There's, it's not a hard... I think every pastor has to communicate with the Lord himself and, and get direction. We're able to save a lot of money. And, you know, when I think about all this, I don't, I don't regret any of it. This church is such, a, such an incredible blessing, you know? And CCLW truly practices what Paul wrote when he wrote to the church in, in Galatia in chapter 6, verse 6. He says, let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Right? And today it's a blessing to be freed from, you know, the, the work in the world, so to speak, the secular, in order to give myself to, to the spiritual work. Yet, remember that Paul himself worked also. So, I give that to you. So, as soon as the commandment was given, verse 5, right? Hezekiah gave the commandment, everybody give to the work. Um, that the children of Israel brought in abundance. The first fruits of grain and wine and oil and, and honey and of all, uh, the pr produce of the field. And they brought in abundantly the tithe of everything. So the word goes out and, and they tithed everything. 
And the children of Israel and Judah who dwelt in the cities of Judah brought the, the tithe of oxen and sheep and a tithe of the holy things which were consecrated to the Lord, their God. They, they laid in heaps. It was just like piles of stuff of people giving uh, to the work. And it was in the third month they began laying them in heaps and they finished in the seventh month. And, and when Hezekiah and the leaders came and saw the heaps, the mounds of stuff, they, they blessed the Lord and his people. They were like, wow, this is amazing. You know, the, how much people were giving. Then Hezekiah questioned the priests and the Levites concerning the heaps. He was like, what, is, what exactly is all this stuff here? <laughs> what is all this stuff that's gathered here? And Azariah, the chief priest from the house of Zadok, answered him and said, Since the people began to bring the offerings into the house of the Lord, we have, we, have, we have had enough to eat and have plenty left, for the Lord has blessed his people, and what is left is this great abundance. Hezekiah is saying, so they said to Hezekiah, this was, you know, over in abundance. That's, that's what's happening here. Now, again, I, I can't help but place myself and the church here in this story because I'll never forget when, when we placed this opportunity to purchase this facility to the church when it was laid out before the people and the abundance that was coming in it was just it was crazy and um, I, I always marvel at the generosity of the people of this church it, 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 it astounds me it, it's just it's really breathtaking to watch at times how there's this this spirit of just giving and and it's and it's all free will it's not like you know you guys gotta, you know it's never like that it's it's just hey i think i think maybe the lord's in this maybe the lord wants us to buy this facility and everybody's like what are you crazy you know we have no money we literally had zero when we came from irvington we 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 were just about almost dead and it was pre presented to us that, you know, maybe, maybe they would want to sell us the building and sell us the facility. And uh, I just threw it out there. And the, the, the money that came in, it was, we, we had, we needed, how much do we need? I think we needed $60,000 in uh, four weeks. And, and, and we got it. We got it in three weeks. Just ridiculous. You know? And that's the Lord. When he puts it on the heart of the people to give, the abundance. I relate to Hezekiah. He's like, what, what is this crazy? I was just laughing the whole time. So, so much was given here that in verse 11, Hezekiah commanded them to prepare rooms in the house of the Lord and they prepared them. And then they fully brought in the offerings, the tithes, the dedicated things. Kananiah, the Levite, had charge over them, and Shimei, his brother, was next. And here's some more names of all the people that were in charge of the rooms to, to try and get this stuff in order, to put all this stuff away in the house of the Lord. All these offerings, the grain and the wine, and the, I mean, it was just, it was astounding. Um, Verse 14, Kor, the son of Imna, the Levite, the keeper of the East Gate, was over the free will offerings to God to distribute the offerings of the Lord and the most holy things. And, and under him were Eden and some more names. And notice his faithful assistance, right? In the cities of the priests to distribute allotments to their brethren by divisions to the great as well as the small. Free will offerings. Faithful assistants, faithful men were given charge over the distribution of the offerings that was for the priests and for the, the Levites. Faithful people must be in charge of such things, right? Besides those males from three years old and up were, were uh, written into the genealogy. They distributed to everyone who entered the house of the Lord his daily portion for the work of his service by his division. Three and up. Okay. So the priests were written in the genealogy there, verse 17, father's house, Levites from 20 years old and up, according to their work by the divisions, and to all who were written in the genealogy, their little ones, their wives, their sons, their daughters, the whole company of them, for in their faithfulness they sanctified themselves in holiness. 
So again, this provision's coming to everyone, all of the Levites and the, and the priests, everyone who was doing the work of ministry, everyone was able to get assistance from the rest of the tribes of Israel. Also for the sons of Aaron, the priests who were in the fields of the common lands of their cities in every single city, there were men who were designated by name to distribute portions to all the males among the priests and to all who were listed uh, by genealogies among the Levites. So thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah, and he did what was good and right and true before the Lord his God. Very important verse, right? Hezekiah did what? Good, what was right, and what was true. And that's a good way to live your life, right? To do everything before the Lord, that which is right and true, and that's good. But there's one more part to Hezekiah I really love. And it says, in every work that he began in the service of the house of God, in the law, the commandment, to seek his God, he did it with all his heart. Right? He did it with all his heart, so he prospered. Right? It, it, it's, it's a good thing to do things that are good and right, right, and, and true. But it's a whole other thing to do it with all your heart. To have your heart in it. You know, a, a religious person can do all those things, can do things that are good, things that, you know, you kind of feel forced into it. Right. To do what's right and good and true. Right. You know, we should, you know, but it's a whole different thing when you're doing it with your heart. That's a whole different, whole different thing. I think that's what makes Hezekiah such a great man. He was a man of the heart. His heart was in it. And that's why everything that he did prospered. It's wonderful to, to consider if, uh, you know, Hezekiah read from Solomon. Where in Ecclesiastes 9.10, he says, whatever your, hands, uh, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Right? To do it with your heart. Go for it. Because... Time is short. Time is real short. We are um, we're in the process right now. My wife and I we're we're going through um, tapes from twenty five years ago. You know those CD, those cassette, those cassette. Uh, that, you know the, the tapes you know and you put it in the you you know they, they were those little ones and you put it in the thing and then they could, it opens up and, and it's a full size you know VHS you know thing and, you, and we're watching this stuff and it's it's blowing my mind and it, it's pretty shocking how fast time goes just just to watch you know we, I was watching one tape where we, we, we dedicated the building in Irvington to the Lord. That's already how many years ago? That's 16 years ago? Right? Something like that. It's just, it's a blink how fast it goes. And um, I wonder if Hezekiah knew um, that he had a short time to, to really impact lives. You know, I wonder if we fully understand how short our time is to impact lives for the kingdom of God. You know. Because Assyria now comes against Hezekiah in um, the 32nd chapter of 2 Chronicles. Because it says, after these deeds of faithfulness, the, re the recorder, the chronicler writes down, after all these reforms by Hezekiah, it says, Sennacherib, the, the king of Assyria, came and entered Judah. And he encamped against the fortified cities, thinking to win them over to himself. Sennacherib, King of Assyria, the, 
the world power at the time, Assyria. Um, he was probably looking at this little tiny country and he's saying, this is going to be an easy takeover. We're going to mop them up. And he comes against them. And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, had come, and that his purpose was to make war against Jerusalem, he consulted his leaders and commanders to stop the water from the springs which were outside the city, and they helped him. So Hezekiah, he consults his leaders, which is always a good thing to do, right? Seeking wisdom, wise people, unlike a lot of the kings we've seen who consulted the young kids, right? <laughs> and what did it do? It always got them in trouble, right? Here, Hezekiah is seeking leaders. And the plan was to, you ever, ever stop the water hose on somebody? They drink it from the water hose and you, you stop it, right? And then you let it go and it's basically. That's what they do. This is what they do. They said, you know what, let's, let's crank up the water on the Assyrians and why, why should they drink water? And that's what they did. They, they plugged up the water so that the Assyrians who were trying to take over Jerusalem didn't have water. So thus many people gathered together who stopped all the springs in the brook that ran through the land saying, why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? So it was a good plan. So more practical things they do besides just stopping the water on the Assyrians, making it uncomfortable for them that they strengthened themselves, they built up all the wall that was broken, raised it up to the towers, built another wall outside, they also repaired the millow in the city of David and made weapons and shields in abundance. The millow was the place, if you remember back in uh, Second Kings, where they, that's where they built all the military up. That was like uh, David's armament place, the millow. So they made weapons and shields. So Hezekiah was practical. He's practical. He's building up the walls. He's building weapons. Then he sent military captains over the people, gathered them together to him in the open square of the city gate. Now Hezekiah, now he's going to encourage the people with good words because the Assyrians, are, they're in your backyard. That's not good. When you have a mass of people at your front door looking to take you over, it's pretty discouraging. So Hezekiah, he goes, he goes Braveheart. Anybody like Braveheart? You, don't you love when, you know, it's, it's, it's the scene, right? It's like, we're going to get down the road, we're going to fight them, and we're going to be here. And all, the, yeah, all the people, yeah, you know, they're all red, their veins are popping, they got their swords, they're banging, you know, they're ready to go. That's what Hezekiah does. We need that every now and then. We need that rah-rah. And that's what Hezekiah does here. He, he gave them encouragement, it says, in the open, in, in, in front of everybody. Right? He, he gave them encouragement. How? He said, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, nor dismayed before the king of Assyria, nor before all the multitude that is with him, for there are more with us than with him. There's more with us than with them. And I'm sure it was at that time that some of the people looked around and went, how's that work? How, do, how does that work? How do you get to a place in your life where you say there's more of us than, than with them? You have to see in the spirit. That's the only way. You have to be spiritually minded in order to see that. Hezekiah was a spiritual man. Hezekiah was fully convinced that God was on his side. How are you doing with that? How's that working for you? 
Are you fully convinced that God is on your side? How do I know that? Well, he gave his son to die on a cross for you. That whoever believes in the son will never die but have eternal life. God is for you. He's not against you. How do I know that? I look at the cross of Jesus Christ. I know he loves me. How do I know he loves me? He gave his son to die for me. That's how much I know he loves me. Assyria was the dominant power in the day. Surely way, way more fighters on the Assyrian side. But Hezekiah saw things in the spirit. I'm reminded of the time in 2 Kings chapter 6. You remember the story, possibly, when Elisha kept telling Israel's king all the plans that the Syrians were making. Every time this, these, the Syrians wanted to go rout Israel, Israel kept finding out. The king of Israel kept finding out like what was going on with the Syrians. So it got a little crazy for the Syrian king. And he was furious. He said, who keeps telling Israel my plans? Who keeps telling Israel what we're about to do? He thought there was somebody in his, in his camp that was a plant. Somebody said, well, there's a man, there's a guy on that side in Israel. His name is Elisha. Who knows everything you speak, even in the bedroom. The Syrian king sent horses and chariots to go get this guy, Elisha. We're going to go take him out. Well, Elisha's servant wakes up one morning, comes out. <sighs> scared to death. Elisha's servant was scared to death that morning. He woke up and he looks out and there they are, the Assyrians. They're coming for Elisha. Ain't looking good. And Elisha's servant looked at Elisha and he said, Oh, my master, what are we to do? 2 Kings 6, 15. So he answered, do not, fear for, do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. You remember that? Elisha saw in the spirit, like Hezekiah here. And, I, and again, I, I think Elisha's servant looked at him and he's like, How, how do you, how do you, how, you know, you know, there's funny math, right? You ever, you ever hear funny math, you know? That's funny math. And Elisha prayed, he said, Lord, I pray that you open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and, he, and said, Lord, smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. I'm a believer. <laughs> I'm a Bible believer. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe he has all the power. I believe me against any amount of people, it's still a mismatch because Father is behind me. Do you believe that? Only if God could open our eyes for just a second, it would be pretty astonishing. It would really blow our minds if God just showed us what's behind us. And who's on our side? Remember when Paul wrote to the church in Rome in the 8th chapter, 31st verse, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Have we gotten to that place where we believe that? God's, God is for me. He's not against me. I'm on his team. I chose Jesus. I want to be on 
the team that wins. First John 4.4, 4, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. The enemy is just going to keep coming at you. The enemy is forever, until the day that we're with Jesus, the enemy is going to keep coming and coming at us and saying, you're, you're, you're puny. You are small compared to the enemy that's out there. And, and we're, it's always going to be a life of faith on, on our part to say, no, no. I see things a little differently than the way that the enemy portrays it. I see things totally different than the way the enemy wants to make it look. Hezekiah said in verse 8 there, with him, has, uh, Sennacherib, with him, with Sennacherib is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. He's given the rah-rah speech. God is on our side. And notice the people were strengthened by the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. That's it, right? Okay, so the battles... No, 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 the enemy keeps coming, you see. And after this, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, sent his servants to Jerusalem, but he and all the forces with him laid siege against Lachish. To Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Judah with him in Jerusalem, saying, Thus says Sennacherib, king of Assyria, In what do you trust that you remain under siege in Jerusalem? The enemy comes against Israel and says, Who are you trusting in? Are you guys crazy? Don't you see this great Assyrian army? Don't you see? In what do you trust? That's the enemy's words to try and trip us up. But to the Christian, you could spin those words and say, yes. In what do I trust? I trust in the Lord. I trust in God. I know it's hard sometimes to walk by faith and not by sight, to look at the enemy and to look at all those things that are against you. I know it's hard. And the enemy always wants us to look at the fight he always wants you to stare at the fight. He always wants you to look at the challenge. He always wants you to look at the war that's in front of you. But he doesn't want you to look at your God, which is where we need to look. Looking at the small army, the words of one man, it's easy to say, you know what? In what are we trusting in? And doubt creeps in to Israel. The enemy is slick, isn't he? He's slick. Does not Hezekiah persuade you to give yourselves over to die by famine and by thirst, saying the Lord our God will deliver us from the hand of the king of Assyria? Again, this, this taunting is coming to Israel. Has not the same Hezekiah taken away his high places and his altars? Sennacherib is saying Hezekiah has deprived his people of the places where they can worship their gods. Plural. Their God. But Sennacherib has no idea that God has prescribed where? Jerusalem. And how many altars there should be. There should only be one. The enemy doesn't understand that. Coming against Hezekiah. Read on. And commanded Judah in Jerusalem saying, You shall worship before one altar and burn incense on it. The Assyrians believed in gods, plural. The more gods you have on your, side, on your side, they thought, the better. You guys, Israel, only have one God. How are you going to win a war with only having one God on your side? It's like that in, in, it's like that in Cambodia. When you're, when you're sharing the gospel with the Cambodian people who, who have multitude of gods... Buddha is revealed in so many different ways. They, 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 the, the more gods they feel, the better. So when you come preaching Jesus God, they're like, oh, I like that too. I'll take Jesus God too. And I add him to my other gods. Yeah. 
But then we have to say, no, 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 you're not understanding. There is only one true and living God. There, Jesus is supreme God. There's only one God. They look at you like, this, guy, this guy's crazy. It takes time to, to explain to them that there's only one God. It's a foreign thought. Here it is. You're depriving your people from going to worship the gods, says Sennacherib. Then he says, do you not know what I and my fathers have done to all the peoples of the lands? Again, Sennacherib is trying to show how powerful Assyria is. Were the gods of the nations of those lands in any way able to deliver their lands out of my hand? Well, apparently not. However, Israel and we worship a living God. Who was there among all the gods of those nations that my fathers utterly destroyed that could deliver his people from my hand, that your God should be able to deliver you from my hand? <laughs> now, therefore, do not let Hezekiah deceive you or persuade you like this and do not believe him. For no God of any nation or kingdom was able to deliver his people from my hand or the hand of my fathers. How much less will your God, single, singular, singular, deliver you from my hand? Furthermore, his servants spoke against the Lord God and against his servant Hezekiah. He also wrote letters to revile the Lord God of Israel to speak against him, saying, as the gods of the nations of other lands have not delivered their people from my hand, so the God of Hezekiah will not deliver his people from my hand. Then they called out with a loud voice in Hebrew to the people of Jerusalem who were on the wall to frighten them, to trouble them, that they might take the city. And they spoke against the God of Jerusalem as against the gods of the people of the earth, the work of men's hands. Spreading fear. Trying to make Israel fearful people. What is fear? I like how one man said it. He said that fear is the dark room where we develop all our negatives. Man, I like that. Go into our dark place, and it's there that we develop all of our negatives. We're great at that, aren't we? We go into that dark place and we go, what if? And we develop it, right? And what if this happens? And what if that happens? And <gasps> now your heart's beating. Now you can hardly see straight. You're so, con you know, you're so frightened. You're so scared. Then a little... Uh, well, that's going to go on, and that's going to happen, and this is going to happen, and, and, and you're playing all these things in your mind. And before you know it, you're all messed up. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And the God of peace will be with you. Right? Stay out of that dark room. Stay away from those negatives. Stop listening to the enemy. Producing all these doubts, all these fears. They come at us like fiery darts, right? Coming at us. Don't listen to that stuff. Now because of this, in verse 20, King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, they, pried and they prayed and they cried out to heaven. They turned their attention to heaven. And then the Lord sent an angel who cut down every mighty man of valor, leader and captain in the camp of the king of Assyria. Not a mountain full of angels. One angel. One angel. 
So he, the, the heathen king, he returned shamefaced to his own land. And when he had gone into the temple of his God, some of his own offspring struck him down with the sword there. His own offspring. <laughs> Killed him. So it says, Thus the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and from the hand of all the others, and guided them on every side. And many brought gifts to the Lord at Jerusalem and presented them to Hezekiah, king of Judah, so that he was exalted in the sight of all nations thereafter. So in those days, Hezekiah was sick. He was near to death. And he prayed to the Lord, and he spoke to him and gave him a sign. But Hezekiah did not repay according to the favor shown him, for his heart was lifted up. No! That's what I want to do sometimes. You read about the, no, no, no! <laughs> Say it isn't so. Say it isn't so. Remember what we just read. He, they brought many gifts, right? Verse 23, he was exalted. Verse 25, his heart was lifted up. Therefore, the wrath was looming over him, over Judah and Jerusalem. Hezekiah's one blemish right here to his otherwise amazing reign. Pride can hit anyone. Pride can hit anyone. Hezekiah's heart was lifted up even in a time when he was struggling with a sickness. He was, he, was, he was sick, and yet he was still lifted up in pride because of all the things that were going on around him. Then Hezekiah, notice what he does, which is different than many of the other kings. Verse 26 is a turning point. Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come upon them in the days of Hezekiah. He humbled himself. In the midst of pride, when we find ourselves out there, humble yourself. Jesus said, whoever humbles himself, will, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself, he will be exalted. Right? Hezekiah has a comeback, and it's called humility. Hezekiah had very great riches and honor, and he made himself treasuries for silver, for gold, precious stones, Spices, shields, all kinds of desirable items, storehouses for the harvest, the grain, the wine, the oil, stalls for the livestock, fords for flocks. Moreover, he provided cities for himself and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance. For God had given him very much property. This same Hezekiah also stopped the water outlet of Upper Gihon and brought water by tunnel to the west side of the city of David. Hezekiah prospered in all of his works. However, regarding the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, whom they sent to him to inquire about the wonder that was done in the land, God withdrew from him in order to test him that he might know all that was in his heart. So past the Assyrians, now the Babylonians are coming. That's the next world power. And they come in. You remember they, in, in Kings, they, it says that they sent in people to check out, to spy out what was going on in Israel. And you remember Hezekiah said, hey, check this out. Oh, look at this. Hey, let me show you the water springs. Oh, let me show you all that I have. And, and his, Hezekiah's leader said, you, what are you doing? That was the Italian version. Right? What are you, you know, with the hand, what are you doing? What are you thinking? So it was God who was testing Hezekiah. Testing him. Proverbs 17, 3 says, The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the hearts. The Lord tests us sometimes. Sometimes the Lord will pull back, kind of like leave us to ourselves so that we can find out what is really going on in our own heart. He leaves us there. No, he will never leave us because we're Christians, sort of like heaven being in jeopardy. That, that can't happen. But God is not outside of leaving us to our own devices so that we can see exactly who we are on the inside. He lets us see who we are. And to learn what is really inside is sometimes the hardest thing that we can ever learn. 
Remember, Jesus says in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches, he who abides in me, and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. That's probably the hardest thing that we can ever learn as a Christian. To get to that place where we are convinced that apart from God, I could do nothing. But with God, I could do everything. Right? But without him, you can't do anything. Now the rest of the Acts of Hezekiah's goodness and deed, they are written in the vision of Isaiah. When we get to the prophet Isaiah, we'll, we'll learn more about Hezekiah there. Hezekiah was the prophet at the time. We can learn about Hezekiah also in the kings of Judah and Israel. So Hezekiah rested with his fathers. They buried him in the upper tombs of the sons of David and old Jer Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to honor him at his death. Then Manasseh, his son, reigned in his place. He was, third, he was 12 years old. First verse of chapter 33. We're not going into 33. Don't get, don't get nervous. You guys are going, oh, he's going way long. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem, but he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Yay! Looking forward to it. That's the wrap-up next week. We finish with 2 Chronicles. Hezekiah. Horrible. Hor How do you have a dad like that, and you end up as a horror? I don't know crazy such a great man Hezekiah leading a great revival false gods and their altars being destroyed Hezekiah setting up the divisions for the worship at the temple great great man of God Hezekiah tells the people to get back to giving to the work of ministry why so that the priest can just focus on taking care of the word Abundance flowed from the hearts of the grateful people. And Hezekiah did throughout all Judah, and he did what was good and right and true before the Lord. Don't forget that. But what made it even more beautiful was that with his heart. Whatever you do for the Lord, do it with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do it with everything you got. That's when he prospered. And when the problems came to Hezekiah, as they will with us, we come to the Lord and we ask the Lord to help us in our battles. Hezekiah showed us who he trusted in. And we need to ask ourselves that question, like Sennacherib asked, in what do you trust? Which Sennacherib asked is a question to discourage Israel, but Hezekiah was not moved, for he trusted in the Lord. Lord, thank you for this night. And again, thank you for this precious, precious book that we call the Bible. We thank you for this night. We thank you for the blessing of you speaking to us. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us spiritual eyesight. That we might, again, be reminded that you are for us and you are not against us. And we pray by the Spirit that we would see the great spiritual kingdom that is behind us, that is before us, that is within us. Thank you, Lord, for this blessed night. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great night. Get home safe. Wrap up next week. <laughs>